came to know that two paraplegic girls they were paralyzed below the neck but they were u- able to use their hands and they were cooking and cleaning and doing all the ho- household work but they were told that you are a shame and a burden on us that you are a curse and the family themselves gave gave them poison left left poison next to them and they drank it and died at that point i felt i really needed to do something to be the change that if i you know did nothing now then i'll be part of the problem and not part of the solution and that's where soul free was born hello and welcome to another episode of legendary bath my guest today is ms priti srinivasan is the founder of soul free she's been a state level women's cricket representative of tamil nadu a national level swimmer in all she's an unstoppable woman priti welcome to leisurely bathe how are you doing thank you thank you so much for having me it's my pleasure to be here and uh, how i'm re- doing really well like i said i really get time to have a, a, to do some le- leisurely bathe it's a, and it's it's a wonderful opportunity you've given me thank you thank you so much but 100% um priti we're going to start with i wanted to ask uh, to share a bit about the work you and your foundation soul free is doing Right. Mm, Soul Free is a small public charitable trust. It's a completely transparent organization that is working purely to support uh, and improve the quality of life of persons living with spinal cord injury in India. Um spinal cord injury is a, it's been called the most debilitating condition in the world by the WHO uh, the World Health Organization but in India there is very little in the form of awareness and absolutely no statistical data is available on how many injuries happen every year so taking some other uh, in uh, countries into account the usa states that there are thir- uh, 30 every 38 injuries uh, minutes an injury happens which means there are more than 18000 cases every year in the us more than 250000 or quarter million people with quadriplegia that is they are paralyzed below the neck are uh, living in the US today but in India the sad fact is that uh, they don't even make it the first year after their injury as far as i know because uh, of complications that develop after they leave the hospital and there is no support system of any kind that is available to them very very few rehabilitation <laughs> centers and absolutely no uh, rehabilitation centers for women uh, there may be one or two that are very expensive uh, but for women who are living below the line of poverty there is no hope at all so this is what uh, soul free wants to change actually uh, it came out of uh, what can i say it came out of sheer need in that uh, i lost my father suddenly uh, overnight he was only 57 Uh, one night he had a heart attack the next afternoon he was gone uh, four days later my mother suffered a heart attack and uh, it turned out she needed plastic surgery as, uh, i'm sorry bypass surgery as well so it was a real uh, shock to my system and we didn't know how i was going to survive and then we had to move to chennai for about 3 months for my mother to have the bypass and by the time she came back i came to know that two paraplegic girls they were paralyzed below the neck but they were u- able to use their hands and they were cooking and cleaning and doing all the ho- household work but they were told that you are a shame and a burden on us that you are a curse and the family themselves gave gave them poison left left poison next to them and they drank it and died at that point i felt i really needed to do something to be the change that if i you know did nothing now then i'll be part of the problem and not part of the solution and that's where soul free was born so powerful so powerful uh, and such a such a great initiative uh, that you've started uh, uh, priti priti i uh, one of the things that i've observed you know um, because of my work i've been fortunate to travel um, around the world and in india when i come and see uh, that you know for us in our country we do not have too much of wheelchair access you know if you look into you know going into public transport uh, even you know the mindset of people are very different not very accommodative not very um, you know um, not they don't they're not open to understand the challenges and make it a very inclusive kind of an environment so what 
wanted to understand what are the initiatives that Soul Free are t- is taking for empowering people with disabilities. Oh, there are quite a few. First, like you said, uh, the the need is, is there is an absolute need that we raise awareness about this condition, and I think we have had the only seven day uh, awareness campaign on on TV channels uh, in Tamil Nadu, which uh, I have not heard anywhere else. So the awareness programs we run in various schools and colleges speak about the the kind of safety measures that we need to follow, following road safety precautions. portions and those kind of things and just showing people that it may seem like we are invincible and immortal but we are not and we, we need people to understand that a moment uh, of of so called misfortune can can you know have you in a wheelchair for the rest of your life so we do need to ensure that we take all the precautions so awareness is one aspect of what we are doing uh, to prevent because india is the youngest country in the world and 25% of our uh, population is below 25 so if we are able to prevent uh, future injuries then that's the number one thing we need to do but for those who do get injured uh, from the transport of the point of injury to the hospital that is perhaps the most dangerous area so we have uh, connected with various ngos and are even through the government we are trying to uh, educate the first responders to know what spine stabilization is and we are trying to work to ensure that all ambulances are given spine boards where they can stabilize the spine and ensure that immediately after an accident uh, the whatever injury there is doesn't get uh, exacerbated so that is the awareness part of it and the other half is of course uh, you know helping people who have already been injured uh, we need to immediately give the family some counseling when they are in the hospital and tell them that you are not alone you know there are many cases where uh, there are some people who 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 claim that they can cure them for some amount of money and we need to tell them that medically there is no real cure for spinal cord injury but what we can do is teach them how to live with this condition so that they can be almost as independent as as uh, anybody else and lead a very very successful life so in in that how how they are able to to transform themselves from the thought process of being disabled to being positively able how they can get their education uh, we provide mobility aids we provide financial support for various uh, you know uh, if they want to have some computer course if you if they want training uh, in tailoring and other things like that we provide them with uh, all the support they need and later on you know if if they require financial assistance and seed funding to start a, a self sustaining business as well we support them so basically our goal is to ensure that they become as uh, independent as they possibly can be uh, you know both physically and financially phenomenal phenomenal fantastic i think it's a wonderful initiative and uh, for my viewers who are watching this uh, particular episode i've also given uh, the link to soul free foundation uh, website so you can if any one of you want to reach out to soul free and preethi uh, with any form of um, uh, um, uh, synergic uh, support please do that and the information is in the website um, Preeti, we're going to move on to something probably that excites you still today. Cricket. Absolutely, cricket is in my blood. Uh, are you following the India uh, Indian tour to Australia? Yeah, I do watch the highlights whenever I get a chance, but I don't get to watch the way I used to. Right, right. So, obviously, my next question. I mean, I've been, a, you know, a, a Northern cricketer myself. Not as talented as you are. Um, so tell us, you know, through your cricketing life, you know, you know the days when, you know, how did you get selected? How did you get started? You know, the the training days. Anybody that you played with, uh, who's now currently playing for India or played for India, I know you were about to be selected uh, part of the Indian um, women's national cricket team. So, you know, I'll, I'm particularly eager to hear about your cricketing, you know, uh, journey. 
Oh, it's it's actually a beautiful part of my life because uh, I started very young. I started when I was four, and it started with the 1983 World Cup that right. India won. <laughs> and uh, like everybody else in India, I was sitting in front of my television. And uh, the one thing that was different about me from everybody else was that I was supporting the West Indian team. <laughs> While all of India was supporting the Indian team. Um, I was actually supporting West Indies because uh, Vivian Richards was my idol. As long as he played for the West Indies, I supported only them. Right. I, I was in awe of the attitude which, with which he played the game and the kind of fear he evoked the moment he went in, onto the field. So. Yeah. Actually, what happened was when he um, got out, the beautiful catch that uh, Kapil Dev took running backwards, it's still etched in my memory and uh, I mean, hats off to that. But <laughs> I was so involved in the game that I got fever immediately afterwards. Oh I was God. four years old. So my father actually had to carry me away and he took me to the beach and bought me balloons and all that to distract <laughs> me. So that was the kind of involvement I had in the game. And soon after that, he actually took me to a very good coach, Mr. P.K. Dharmalingam, uh, who has coached some of the greats of men's cricket also, like Mr. Uh, K. Shrikant and his son also. Right. So uh, I started, uh, went to training. Uh, there would be 300 boys in the summer camp and I was the only girl. Right. And I was uh, perfectly fine with that because I was just one of the boys, you know. So right. uh, it, it, I had a wonderful time and uh, I started uh, playing in the senior Tamil Nadu team when I was just eight years of age. It's a, it's a record that has you know, it's been more than 25 years and it hasn't been broken. Nobody younger has played for Tamil Nadu. And um, I'm, I'm truly blessed because I got to play with some of the greats of Indian cricket. Sudha Shah uh, was the captain when I started playing and uh, Sumati Ayer. And uh, I've, I've also uh, had some interactions with Shanta Rangaswamiji, who are all uh, still in cricket, who are the, considered the greats of women's cricket. So I've been very privileged in that way because because they were so kind to me. Uh, I was a kid, so they even washed my whites for me and helped me eat and those kind of things. <laughs> so I have beautiful memories. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it was really, uh, I was only twin, 12 years old when I opened the batting for Tamil Nadu. Right. And um, in Bombay, I still remember that I got to play against the Indian Railways. And once I actually hammered uh, Diana Edelji uh, and almost hit her for a six. So that's one of the most moments of my life that I can never forget so absolutely uh, absolutely yeah. uh, and um, you know going forward like you know you represented Tamil Nadu's Ranji team as well women's Ranji team as well and yes, um, and how I mean from 12 in the age of 8 12 when you carried on I mean, it must have been very difficult for you keeping up your studies and you know playing cricket at that level no, actually, I was not only playing cricket, I was swimming also. Right. So, uh, I was almost training six, seven hours a day. So, my life wasn't easy at the time. Uh, I would have to get up at four in the morning, get uh, ready and then go, go go for swimming at five. And then, actually, they used to give me, whenever I was uh, already chosen for the state, they, they would give me like one hour of, uh, the first period would be free in school. Right. So, so, I would join school a little late and then uh, when school got over at 3.30 my parents would show up with uh, all my swimming gear and I would change in the school and then run for coaching for swimming coaching right. so I would come back home by 7.30 do my homework and then go off to sleep which, and even then you know by 10 o'clock uh, I would hide under my uh, cover and, and try to read some Nancy Drew or something. Right, so, right. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was not easy at all, but somehow I excelled in everything because uh, uh, I got so much support and love from, from my parents. I, I never, it never occurred to me to rebel against anything. And uh, by nature, I, I'm... <laughs> I'm a kind of a per uh, perfectionist, so I, I never take anything less than that. For uh, so I, by nature, I was hardworking, and uh, it really paid off. And 
that's the thing you know by 18 i thought i was all that you know i worked hard and uh, i reaped the rewards and i felt i deserved everything but then you know life changes in a split second right so you spoke about like you know briefly about your school giving you an hour um, you know uh, to giving you give you the option to you know start an hour later tell us about your school it seems like you know there's been a lot of support uh, from your school around that Yes absolutely uh, I have had the opportunity the privilege I should say uh, to go to nine different schools in three different continents so <laughs> I, I I can tell you that one the school that I that influenced me most uh, it's in Chennai it's called Vidya Mandir and uh, there are no uniforms till fifth grade no exams and um, you know you are basically allowed to think for yourself Uh, it right. has uh, i feel that it uh, some of the most original thinkers um, you know of of the generation went to school there so uh, i feel very very blessed to be from that school because you could say anything to the teachers like for example in fifth grade one of the teachers in history class asked me which of you think studying history is a waste and i actually stood up and said we don't seem to learn anything from history anyway so why do we even study it <laughs> because we keep <laughs> repeating ourselves over and over again but uh, now i think about it for a 12 year old to stand in front of everybody in class and say that to a teacher how many schools will permit that i don't know so right. um, just expressing yourself in yeah, that critical the, thinking i think is so important uh, you know um, especially in those development years yes the independence to just speak your mind is is a uh, widely important correct right? priti uh, you know you you spoke about you know at the age of 18 you think thought like you know you've you kind of like you know you know achieved and you know you've you you really truly achieved a lot of things but life changed for you in a split second yes uh how you know i'm not going to you know talk about uh, or you know about how it happened and all uh but what i want to understand and this is specifically for me and uh my viewers is how did you build your mental muscles and because it has inspired me and many like me who are watching this show yeah honestly it wasn't a fun journey or it wasn't a short journey and uh in life we seem to think that easy or comfortable uh, is is actually the thing we seek i mean all the security we seek so is that so that we can have control over a situation so that we can do it on our own terms well i can only say that my entire life is lived outside my comfort zone <laughs> so so uh it's it's not been easy um I had my accident when I was 18. I I was a teenager like everybody else going for a high school uh, for a college excursion and it, it I went to Pondi and while we were playing in about thigh deep water I I was tripped by uh, a receding wave so I just stumbled and being a seasoned swimmer I started swimming at the age of 3 I've been a large segment of my first 18 years was spent in water so i just dove into the water uh, like i have i don't know how many million times before that but on that particular occasion the moment my face went under water i felt like a shock travel through my body and i couldn't move so there was not a drop of blood i didn't lose consciousness i just waited for a few seconds and my friends pulled me out and in the span of those 20 seconds everything every dream i had uh, my very identity of who i thought i was uh, was shattered because i broke my neck in the c4 c5 region and became completely paralyzed below the neck and from there on i mean oh, how the process yeah. of recovery the mental you know the what you have achieved today has would not have been possible without you know the mind the strength of the mind Absolutely. and i'm sure like you know uh, a lot of this is also about the support system support environment that you got from your parents uh, you know talk us all those things yeah uh, so at 18 like i stopped now uh, 
I didn't have words. I didn't know what was happening to me. I I was in denial, and I tried to escape as as best as I could. Um, yeah. I would just watch TV the whole day, or listen to audio books, or do anything except think about what had happened to me and what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. It it just I could not go there, and it took me several years. Um, my parents, of course, uh, are. are uh, the only reason i'm alive today my my parents have sacrificed their whole lives so that i may live with dignity they started taking care of me they never they never even let it touch me that i was different they never uh, let me feel like i was less than never once i think that is perhaps the greatest gift that i've been given is that never once did they blame me never once did they say look at what you've done to yourself you've not destroyed your own life but you've destroyed ours also they never gave me a hint of that so they just accepted uh, me and they never saw me as i was as i was something before that like so i i was able to go on on some level but i was in shock and i was in denial it took me uh, a few years to get out of that and i, I would say our shift from uh, from where we were at the time to uh, to tiruvannamalai which is a very very special uh, uh, spiritual location in in tamil nadu um, and uh, with with the grace of the guru and the great masters i i actually came full circle i had lost myself completely and uh, piece by piece like like humpty and dumpty they put me back together again <laughs> and uh, unlike unlike the rhyme i think um, i i'm completely whole now so i'm not bound by the limitations of my body and i feel that through two near death experiences i i've been taught a lot uh i don't think in in 16 or 20 normal lifetimes i could have learned what i have learned in these 22 years of being uh, a quadriplegic so um i i don't regret a moment of my life and in fact i feel blessed um actually i have a story i, I don't want to drag this for very long but no no please go ahead you know this is literally baat hai yes so in that case one of the first things i remember uh, when it comes to prayer is uh, i must have been about 7 or 8 years of of age going to school one of the things that we were taught is uh, after your bath you you go and make a small prayer and then you go off to school or the rest of your day so you just start your day by making uh, a prayer to god and one of the there was only one prayer that repeated itself uh time and again i i would actually visualize myself and uh it would be like a black board with pluses and minuses and all that and i would erase all that so my true desire in life was to become a blank slate wow uh, yeah so for i don't even know how a 6 or 7 year old could could fathom what that means but if that was my true uh, goal in life then this lifetime is the, is the is the best opportunity to fulfill that dream to fulfill my true goal in life i mean i could have played cricket for india i could have been a ceo i could have been a successful wife and mother and all that would not have taken me towards my actual ultimate goal of being because if you keep writing on the board then how do you become a blank slate so uh, the ability to lead a life without personal bond which can actually be in service of the greater good i feel is is what it's it's fulfilling my true goal in life and uh, i feel very blessed for that so this is what this lifetime has taught me uh, how blessed i am for every every second of life and it doesn't have to be easy it's not easy at all pain is a very much a part of my life if i look at how difficult it is then i wouldn't get out of bed but the thing is i don't expect it to be easy i expect it to be a challenge i expect it to give me uh, something more than comfort which is fulfillment and that i do receive so if if 
instead of going after something that we think we need we can embrace what we are given and see the beauty of what we are given and see how uh, god never gives us anything less than what we want then i think our life is made wow. and unfortunately i i feel that in in the name of entertainment and in the name of fun oh, i don't understand how losing your sense of 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 right and wrong and losing your sense of uh, i don't know i don't understand why alcohol is fun it just it defeats the purpose for me so i don't understand a lot of things that society claims is is success or is entertainment or fun so for me uh, this is fun uh, because i get to learn the most about myself and i get uh, to lead a life of of greater purpose i can today say that at least a thousand families of people living with paralysis and living below the line of poverty are able to live because of the work soul free is doing and that for me is the greatest bit of fun on earth wow wonderful soul free priti i mean it's you know i was just listening and i was uh, almost like you know how to get lost into into the depth of that blank slate um very well said very well explained what i wanted to ask you is you know you spoke about fulfillment how do you define success oh yes that is a very very important question in today's world i feel because uh, uh, the society's yardstick for success is really warped in my opinion um to me success is not the person who has everything because if you have everything you have everything to lose correct but success is actually the person who needs nothing who is beyond want and beyond desire and who is completely self fulfilled in the way he or she is is in this moment and in that sense i feel very successful because i don't need anything i'm perfectly happy i've gone and spoken to the top management of the biggest companies and i've said hey guys smile it and i can't buy a smile from them sometimes so right. when i ask them well, what is it that you need how come that i have lost everything that you fear will break you and i'm the happiest person in the room right you see i i remember like um, you know watching your uh, ted talk and uh, you know the way you started you know and the analogy of a vehicle you know coming in a car and you coming in in your own car so i'd love you to you know share that with our viewers yes i one of the things i'm doing is i'm actually uh, doing my phd at iit madras mm-hmm. so uh, my uh, view of disability so called disability is completely different from most i feel that everybody is disabled we start out of disability and we go back to being disabled so the it takes us 4 years to even learn bowel and bladder control and most of us go back to being disabled at some point for example both of us are wearing glasses right right so why are we wearing glasses because our vision isn't perfect so in that sense we have an impairment right so impairment can happen to anybody but it becomes disablement when society does that to you and close the doors on you and then makes you feel that you are unable to so that uh, that is the way i i use different uh, i try to come on on level with people to make them understand that disability so called disability is just perception so that the, the joke i tell people is that uh you know the car is a great great so, uh, societal status symbol so having a, a mercedes or, or or let's say even a porsche is is considered a huge status symbol so let's say you have a ferrari and you're in mumbai and i have my own ferrari it has four wheels and it ha- it goes at 7 kilometers an hour and i can go in places no car can go and in mumbai's traffic i'm pretty sure i will reach ahead of them 
so what's so great about having a car i would say that the car is nothing more than a glorified wheelchair correct so why is the wheelchair looked down upon it's just a matter of perception correct 100% do you think do you think uh, we or most of us lead a very reactive life my father used to call it somnambulism sleep walking <laughs> so uh, in in a sense i feel that we lead very isolated and insulated lives that uh, most of us develop like a raincoat like an armor around us so that we don't feel so in a way the reactiveness initially we react and then we understand that nobody accepts reactions like most of the time reactions cause pain mm. it it causes either anger or hurt or something reactions cause pain so our emotions open open and raw emotions aren't accepted by society mm. so what we need to do then is to uh, somehow not feel and i think that's what we do i think that is the only scenario in which alcohol can be fun is because it doesn't it it helps you not feel anymore right. so that's what we do we actually make ourselves emotional islands and then we get depressed that we are alone because in our i i don't know schools actually teach us not to feel anymore like uh, one of the things i say is all of us stigmatize because there is always the one kid who is shorter or with the color or something something for some reason maybe uh, he's in a wheelchair or she's in a wheelchair there is some reason why one of the kids at least one of the kids in every class is discriminated faces uh, ragging faces uh, isolation and is excluded by everybody else and none of the cool kids take that risk to go and sit with the kid right because their their status they are so invested in their status so that is what i i ask people why don't why don't we take that risk why don't we take the risk of accepting everybody as they are and trying to include them i'm not talking about disability here at all i'm talking about each and every one of us have felt what it feels like to be excluded and yet we do it every day why so true so i think the the attributes um, of being cool needs to be redefined yes. and uh, it, it it comes you know from you rightly said you know it has to come from um, from their schooling days the early age a lot to do with positive parenting and yeah. i think uh, instead that's instead of just being just doing what the majority is doing correct right. just because everybody is doing it doesn't mean it's right mm-hmm. I mean this whole idea of look I'm as feminist as it can be but I don't feel that to be a liberated woman I have to smoke or do drugs I don't understand why poisoning my system is cool right so so, so, so there are a lot of things that society is doing that because I'm a feminist because I'm my own person I choose not to do correct but they just start following the crowd and it's if they're doing it by their choice that's fine but i don't think many people are actually thinking and uh doing some self inquiry into why are they actually doing it right right so if if in that if that's what you mean by reactive then that's what it is but for me it's just a uh, a lot of uh, i feel it, uh this this um lack of feeling this this apathy even towards the self that we don't want to go within we don't want everything is shallow because we don't want to ask difficult questions we don't want to feel pain we just we just want to do what's easy and that's somehow not my way right no very well said uh priti what i wanted to ask you it was the end of the show the last question which i have for you is what advice do you have for those in the disabled community 
want to live independently and you know this is a very important question i wanted to ask you uh, on behalf uh, of young disabled uh, you know adults especially uh, who are now at the threshold because you know life around them are changing it's a very difficult uh, you know proposition you know specifically you know um, they are caregivers their you know their their life is also changing they're getting older but in yeah. all this i think what i want to focus in this is is their independence you know how does how how do they prepare themselves so you've been a you've been such a stark role model you know for them for many uh, and i think that's what i wanted to you know hear and and i hope uh, a lot of people would gain and get advice and uh, would get a lot of inspiration from this absolutely i mean that is a really deep question and there is no simple answer for it uh, honestly because the physical uh, dependence that comes out of the um, the, the impairment whatever i say doesn't change that i'm paralyzed below the neck and unless somebody lifts me out of bed and puts me in a wheelchair i can't start my day so that level of dependence is always going to be there but what we can do is that we can make ourselves as independent as possible in thought and deed and we can make ourselves financially stable so that we can get somebody to do that for us and yet keep our dignity intact that becomes the key we need people who are compassionate enough who can do what is basically needed without making making us feel less than because we are not less than if we are paying them a respectable salary and giving them all those things they need then it becomes almost a barter because we are giving them what uh, they need and they are giving us something that we need so in no way are we less than anybody else so that is what i would say is that if we become financially and uh, in other ways uh, completely independent then we are able to ensure that our limitations don't limit us from living the kind of life we want living with dignity living with purpose and living our dreams so yes there are a lot of difficulties like you said we live in a completely uh, apathetic and inaccessible country and we need to fight and we need to change that on every level of society and we start with changing the mindsets of people and that's what i'm trying to do as best as i can because uh, each person Uh, who is listening now if they can go out there tomorrow and say that just because a person can't physically do something it doesn't mean they are less than me in any way that they are just they have a set of limitations that need to be accommodated and if we have that accommodation then if we have a level playing field then everything is fine for example uh, i want to tell you this like uh, i spoke to a, an american senator who was instrumental in actually creating the ada the american disabilities act and he had a younger brother who was hearing impaired uh, he was working in a bakery and very unhappy there so he met somebody uh, a person who came to purchase something at the bakery and he wrote a, a, a letter to him saying are you happy in this workplace so uh, the 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 person the hearing impaired person basically said no i find it very boring and repetitive so the, this man said will you come with me to my factory and he took him to this huge factory where there were a lot of machines but the the normal hearing people had to wear huge headphones and uh, you know the noise cancellation system that that still would be painful and would uh, create some level of damage but this guy in this factory was absolutely bindas he was so happy he could work there because he didn't hear a thing wow yeah. so in that sense that work plays basically the person with normal hearing becomes the person with a disability correct so all it means is that if we change the perception and if we accommodate the person's limitation so that they are on par with everybody else and give them equal opportunity then nobody is disabled 
wonderful so this is what i want to tell them you know that just find that place that niche where you are special and then you will not feel that you are disabled but you are positively able absolutely and i feel that is how we are all positively able and nobody is less than anybody great great i think that's a wonderful thing that you mentioned abhishek is about positive being positively able and uh, priti thank you so much for being on the show um, personally you know it's been such a wonderful experience um, you know talking to you and uh, listening to you uh, it's very very inspiring i've been watching your several uh, you know ted and tedx uh, you know speeches uh, and i have one which i can surely say you know is in my collector's item which is in on leisurely bath So thank you so much, and I hope to you know meet you in person on the other side of COVID, and I'm Absolutely. sure the leisurely party will continue from there on. Thank you, thank you, Shivadi, for giving me this wonderful opportunity. I'm so glad, and uh, yeah, I request anybody who watches if they want to take a look at what Solfi is doing, and if and only if they feel that you know we are doing worthwhile work that is changing and impacting lives positively, they can please come forward and support us in any way they like. We we love to have volunteers, and we are starting a rehabilitation center that we are calling Inspire India's first. integrated spinal rehabilitation center here uh, in tiruvannamalai it's a 20000 square feet uh, facility and it's going to be pretty awesome so if if you have any skills that you want to share with us or you want want to volunteer your time or anything we would be most most grateful um, so thank you thank you so much for allowing me to share my soul free journey with you